lost in the darkness of sin, the light of the world is Jesus. Like sunshine at noonday, His glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. Hello. Welcome to Until Ministries, and indeed the light of the world is Jesus. Thank you for joining us. Well, if you've been following us along, we have been in a series of messages dealing with future times, prophetic times. Uh, we call it prophecy uh, because it speaks of what's in the future. And I thought it would be good um, to just let you know that today... Uh, on the screen, there are going to be a lot of biblical references um, talking about today's topic, which is the millennial reign of Christ. And uh, I don't have time to read all those, but I would encourage you, I'll try to um, at least read the references. If you're watching on television, uh, please try to jot down the references and you can look at them later because it's really a glorious topic. And uh, if you're listening on the radio, um, I'll try to read them, so, uh, read the references so that you can jot them down as well. Well, let's start by reviewing the prophetic sequence. Remember, we started our uh, series with a two-message uh, um, sermon on the rapture of the church. That's the blessed hope. It's the next event in the prophetic sequence. Everything that is uh, coming before that has been accomplished, and the rapture could happen at any, at any day. And uh, remember, that's when Jesus comes in the clouds, and those of us who are still alive when he comes, hopefully it'll be us, provided we have Christ in our heart, provided we're believers, we will be taken to be with him. Rapture means to be caught up quickly, um, and we will be with him forever and ever. Um, at the same time, those believers who have gone before us will receive new glorious bodies. We will receive new glorious bodies on the way up if we're still here. Perfect bodies that aren't subject to disease or decay or sadness or pain of any kind. So that's the rapture of the church. The second event that we talked about is called the rewards, and that's the judgment seat of Christ, or the bema as it's called. And that is when we get to heaven after the rapture, that is when we will be rewarded for our service to Christ since we knew him as Savior. It has nothing to do with our sin. Our sin is forgiven. When The moment we receive Christ as our Savior, we take him into our life, we ask him to forgive our sin, and to be our Lord and Savior, our sin is wiped out. So the judgment seat of Christ, or the bema, is for uh, determination or evaluation of the rewards that we will receive in heaven for having uh, served the Lord once we know him as Savior. And remember, these things, uh, the rewards are not for our trophy case. The rewards are to put at the feet of Jesus, and won't that be glorious? So make sure you're living all out for Christ so you'll have something to lay at his feet at the judgment seat of Christ. Then we talked about the ruin, uh, the, the great tribulation period, uh, very difficult topic for all of us, for me to preach and for you to listen, but it dealt with the unprecedented, catastrophic, natural and human and human misery that's brought about as uh, Christ judges the, uh, the, the world during the seven-year tribulation period. Then last week, we talked about the second coming of Christ. This time, uh, at this time of year, we're usually talking about the first coming of Christ, and we will be doing that in the weeks to come uh, when Jesus came humbly in Bethlehem. But at the second coming, which we talked about last time, Jesus comes in power and glory. This time he's not coming as the Lamb of God. He's coming as the Lion of Judah. And he will defeat the forces of the Antichrist, which have arisen during the tribulation period. And today uh, we are talking about the next prophetic event, which is called the Millennium or the Millennial Reign of Jesus Christ. Thousand years, coming from the term millennium, meaning a thousand years. Uh, it's a thousand year period when after Jesus 
comes in his second coming. Remember, we talked about in his second coming, he doesn't come in the air like he did in the rapture. He comes in power and establishes his kingdom physically on the earth, reigning from Jerusalem, from Mount Zion in power and perfection. And during that thousand years, Satan is bound. He's locked up and he's sealed. He is inoperative. Now, people will still sin during that time, but Satan will be bound. And Jesus will rule and reign in perfection for a thousand years. And anything that is wrong will be dealt with on the spot worldwide as Jesus rules the world. And that's what we're going to talk about today is the millennium. Now, the, we want to look first at um, the need for the millennium. And it, is, it has several purposes. This thousand year period when Jesus Christ will rule and reign on this earth and there'll be perfection um, for the first time um, since the initial creation. And so one of the needs for the millennium is to reward the people of God. And that is um, talking about the fact we see this in Isaiah 40 chapter uh, Isaiah 40 verse 10. And we see in Colossians 3.24. And this will be when Jesus uh, allows us as believers, believers of all ages, to co-reign with him on the earth for the thousand years. So you may not have known it, but if you're a believer in Jesus, you've received him as your savior, you will co-reign with Christ for a thousand years. So the question I have for you right off the bat is, will you be there? Will you be there? Will you be ruling and reigning with Christ? And if you uh, have received Christ as your Savior, there's been a time when you've asked him to come into your heart and forgive your sin, be your Lord and Savior. The answer is yes, you will be there. If you've never received Christ as Savior, no, you won't be there and you will be judged. So the degree of, uh, if we're ruling and reigning with Christ, the degree of authority that each of us have will be proportional to the faithfulness and the motivation of our heart as we serve the Lord on this earth. Now, a second reason for the millennium is to respond to the disciples' um, prayer. We usually call it the Lord's Prayer, but the Lord gave it to the disciples to pray. Matthew 6.10 where, as you all know, says, Thy will be done uh, on earth as it is in heaven. And that prayer will be fulfilled because God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven perfectly for a thousand years as Jesus rules and reigns. And then uh, it will be, it'll be that prayer that we've prayed so many times, perhaps not thinking about all the words to have the will of God fill and rule the entire earth, that prayer is answered in the millennium when Jesus is uh, uh, reigning with power and authority for that thousand years and he will be sovereign. We want to look at um, Revelation 20 and uh, uh, verse, I'm going to read the first six verses of Revelation 20 so that you know uh, where uh, the millennium is first mentioned. So it's Revelation 20, 1 through 6. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. Remember, I told you that. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit where he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. We'll talk later about what happens after that. Afterward, he may be released. He will be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and people sitting on them, having been given the authority to judge. And that's all the believers of all ages, the believers during the church age, which we're in now, the believers that are from the Old Testament believers um, that were believers uh, in, in the Lord counted that to righteousness to them until Christ could, be Christ could die and save them 
on the cross. And so uh, then there are those who will, re who will be saved during the tribulation period. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Um, all these will be given authority to judge. So if you know Christ as Savior, you'll be given authority to judge. And then it says, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. This is the ones during the tribulation period. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on the foreheads or their hands. They all came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for the thousand years. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. We'll talk about that later. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them, the second death holds no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So again, that's Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6, and that's where we uh, read about the, um, the millennial reign. But it's interesting that it's, it's, it's mentioned in the prophets, such as Isaiah and Micah and Zechariah and others, and you'll see those later on the screen. But uh, another, we're talking about why there has to be this, this period, this millennial period. And the third reason is uh, to redeem creation. Because remember that when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, um, God cursed the creation because of Adam's sin. And in the millennium, listen to this now, in the millennium, the thorns and the thistles and the sin and the death and the decay are all gone. All those unpleasant things, anything that's negative is all gone. And there's a restoration to the original beauty and glory and harmony and perfection that was before the fall. You can read about this in Genesis 3.17 and then in the New Testament, Romans 8, 19 to 22 talks about how the creation must be redeemed. And then the last reason we'll talk about today that there's got to be a millennium is because man's, man's depravity will um, be affirmed. Because remember, I'm telling you that everything, when Christ is ruling on this earth, Everything is in perfection. Everything is in harmony. Anything that's done wrong is dealt with immediately. Um, and yet, even though Christ is going to rule and show everyone that he is the only one who can bring peace to this earth, he's the only one who can uh, make things perfect again, even after that thousand years, there will be people who still don't believe. Oh, they've had to act in compliance because Jesus is going to rule and they'll have no choice. But when a push comes to shove and Satan is released at the end of, of the millennial reign, it turns out that there will be people that will show their true colors. And even though they've seen Jesus' perfection and his rule, they will still not believe. And this is called Satan's Little Season. We'll talk about that uh, next time. But right after the millennium, there'll be one uh, very short period of final re rebellion for those who lived during that thousand years to show their true colors. Did you believe because, uh, did you say you believed because you were forced to, or did you really love the Lord Jesus with all your heart and that's why you followed him? And that final rebellion will incidentally be crushed and Satan will be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and never be allowed again. Well, let's talk about some positive things now. Let's talk about the nature of the millennium. And this, again, there's many scriptures that are going to come up on the screen and I will try to read the references. The first is Isaiah 11 verses 2 through 5. Um, we see that that's a description of the millennium, and I'm going to go through some of the things that you, so you will see what the millennium will be like. First of all, it will be a time of peace. We see this in Micah 4, 2, and 3, and also in this passage in Isaiah 11. 
that it will be a time of peace. There will be no war. There will be no weapons of war. There will be no military weapons because they will be retooled for agricultural use. This is where the Bible talks about a phrase that you may have heard um, where the swords are beaten into plowshares. You see that? The weapons are beaten into plowshares or instruments for agriculture. All disputes will be settled by the Lord quickly and with full justice. So there's no war. There's no weapons of war. Jesus will deal with any disputes or anything that's wrong or any sin quickly and with perfect justice. Perfect justice. There'll be peace in the animal kingdom as well. Because the wolf will lie down with the lamb. The lion will lie down with the lamb. The calf will lie down with the lion. The leopard with the kid. And so on. There are many animal examples given. Uh, it'll all, so it will be a time of peace. And I want you to remember that that's the only time that there's going to be print, uh, peace on this earth. When the Prince of Peace is ruling for that thousand years, there will be peace total peace on the earth without exception. And then it will not only be a time of peace, it will be a time of prosperity. Uh, Isaiah 35, 1 through 10 goes into tremendous detail. Again, I hope you jot this down, Isaiah 35, 1 to 10, because we don't have the time in our short program to read everything, but it will be a time of prosperity. And Isaiah tells us, now Isaiah of course, was written approximately seven to eight hundred years before Jesus came the first time. And now here's Isaiah who prophesied uh, profusely about Jesus being born of a virgin, being born in Bethlehem and so on when he came the first time. Now here's Isaiah prophesying about the second coming and the establishment of the millennial kingdom, Jesus ruling perfectly on this earth for a thousand years. So it'll be a time of prosperity, Isaiah tells us. The desert will bloom like a rose and be very productive. The earth will be well watered. Physical healing will abound. And there'll be safety and security. Isn't that going to be wonderful? And remember, you and I, if we're believers, if we've received Christ as Savior, we're going to rule and reign with him. So it'll be a time of peace, a time of prosperity. It'll be a time of purity. And here we have a lot of scripture. Uh, Isaiah 11, 9. Isaiah tw um, 25, 9. Uh, Isaiah 66, 23. Zechariah 13, 2. Just to name a few. Jot them down if you can. Um, it will be a time of purity. Holiness will pervade the earth. No harm or destruction anywhere for a thousand years. No lack of people rejoicing. No lack of people worshiping God and pursuing righteousness. So it's a time of peace. It's a time of prosperity. It's a time of purity. It will also be a time of perpetual health. Isaiah 65 verse 20 talks about this. There will be no death. There will be no infant deaths that we see today. Uh, there will be uh, someone, the, Isaiah tells us in this verse that someone who's 100 years old will be regarded as a child because there's perpetual health, there's perpetual life. There's no sickness, no disease, no infirmity, no birth defects, no retardation. Earth will be filled with a, he a healthy human race. So it's a time for perpetual health. And then it will be a time of personal joy. A time of personal joy. There will be true deep-seated joy that flows from a clear conscience and a sense of everyone and everything being right with God. Can you imagine that? That is going to be so, so wonderful. <clears throat> It'll be a time of personal joy. Now again, here are several verses. I'll read the references for those of you listening on the radio and we'll put them on the screen for those of you who are watching on television. 
Isaiah 9, verses 3 and 4. Isaiah 12, verse 3. Isaiah 14, verses 7 and 8. Isaiah 25, verses 8 and 9. Isaiah 30, 29. And Isaiah 42, 1 through 12. All of these scriptures and many more tell us that during the millennium, there will be true, deep-seated joy that flows from a clear conscience and a sense of everyone and everything being right with God. And so, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, most of the people that are in the millennium will uh, truly love the Lord because they'll be in this, this glorious situation and um, the benevolence and power and sovereignty of Jesus making everything right. Um, and people will have the sense that everyone and everything is right with God because Jesus is ruling with such power and such authority and such righteousness. But as I mentioned, um, at the end of the millennium, when we have Satan's little season, and we'll talk about that in more depth later, but um, those who are just going through the motions, so to speak, will get one final chance to declare their faith, their true faith, their true love of Christ. And if it's not there, then they are going to be severely judged. But at the moment, going through that thousand years, pain and agony and despair will be gone and superficial happiness which is the most many people can hope for now superficial happiness will be replaced by true joy in the lord oh it will be so wonderful so um, again let's just review those um, the millennial reign will be a time of peace It'll be a time of prosperity. It'll be a time of purity. It'll be time of perpetual health. And it will be a time of personal joy. Wow, what a menu, huh? And that's what will happen when Jesus is in charge and Jesus is ruling and reigning on this earth. Remember, when this happens, the Antichrist has already been defeated and confined uh, to the lake of fire, and uh, Satan is bound for those thousand years and then released very briefly so people can show their true colors. But what a wonderful, wonderful scene to have all these things, peace and prosperity, purity, perpetual health, and personal joy. Oh, that'll be so great. Uh, and I just hope that you're ready for it. So um, we want to close today with... Uh, our necessary reaction to the teaching about the millennium. How should we react to the millennium? Well, the first thing is make sure that you're on the winning side. Make sure you're on the winning side because guess what? In the end, we who have Christ in our lives, we who have committed our lives to Christ as our Savior, we win. We win. And we will be helping to rule and reign during the millennium. So the first thing is make sure you're on the winning side. Make sure you have asked Jesus Christ um, for forgiveness of your sin. Make sure that you believe that he is the son of God who died on the cross for your sin and rose from the dead. If you believe that he's the son of God and you believe he died on the cross for your sin personally, and you believe he rose from the dead to give you new life, and you ask him to forgive you and to come into your heart and take over your life, then you are going to be on the winning side. Not only are you going to have forgiveness of sin, not only are you going to have absolute positive assurance of eternal life in heaven, but you're also going to be ruling and reigning with Christ during this thousand years. Uh, on the earth. And we'll talk about what's after that in the next couple messages. So my question to you is one that I pose very often on this program. Have you committed your life and heart to Christ? Have you made him Lord of your life? Have you received him and asked for his forgiveness? 
Have you made him your Lord and Savior? Oh, I sure hope so. That because if you have, you will have, as I said, forgiveness of sins, guaranteed eternal life, and the opportunity to rule and reign with Christ for 1,000 years on this earth. So uh, on the other hand, if, if you already have received Christ as Savior, we, you, we need to make sure that we're living for him. We meet, need to make sure that he's the most important person in our lives, that faith in him is the most important thing. It's what makes us tick. Are we living all out for Christ? Are we living, are we giving freely of our time and our talent and our treasure for Christ? Are we ministering for him? Are we serving him? Is he on our mind all the time? Are we communing with him? Are we walking in his presence day by day? Can people look at our lives and hear what we say with our lips and even with our thoughts, are our thoughts committed to Christ? Can they see Christ living out of our lives? That's what it's all about. If you're a Christian, Christ should be shining out of your life. So people that see you and interact with you can say, wow, that person is different. That person must belong to Jesus. So make sure you're living all out for him. Because as I mentioned earlier in the program, your position of ruling with Christ during the millennium will be based on your faithful service, including your motives. Remember, when we talk the judgment seat of Christ, he peels away the motives. So if we do the right thing for the wrong reason, Jesus exposes it. And that's a loss of reward, not a loss of your salvation, but a loss of your reward. So your uh, position, your degree of authority Ruling and reigning with Christ in the millennium is based on your faithful service, including your motives. Uh, only the acceptive motives that glorify Christ will count. And that's how it will be determined what your position in the kingdom is, the thousand-year kingdom that we call the millennium or the millennial reign of Christ. So um, the last thing is, again, our reaction to the millennium Make sure you're on the winning side. Make sure you have him as your Savior. If you do have him as your Savior, make sure you're living all out for him. Make sure you're living a Christian life with the pedal to the metal to glorify Jesus. And the third thing is, make sure you're sharing it with others. Let others know that Jesus is coming again. Let others know that Jesus is going to establish his kingdom. Let others know that if they receive Christ, they'll be taken in the rapture and then they'll be with the Lord forever and ever, including his reign on the earth for a thousand years. Make sure you share the way of salvation with your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, your college, uh, colleagues, your schoolmates, whoever it happens to be. Share with everybody the truth of Christ and his salvation, the free gift of forgiveness and eternal life. And then... Share with them the truth that will help them prepare for the future. Share with them the truth that will help them prepare, prepare for the rapture and what, uh, how to be prepared and be there so that you won't be ashamed when Jesus comes for you. God bless you. Thanks for listening. Jesus.